on my personal journey, I had my share of bad experiences, not just with Rameshwar, but with a number of the new gurus, including Jayatirtha, Bhagawan, and Bhavananda. Uh, I won't share all those experiences here, but I will share several of the major ones and the ones that were directly related to this issue. One of them is how I came to know that the GBC had banned Srila Prabhupada's instructions in the form of his letters and important documents. In 1990, I'm sorry, 1980, I left the LA Temple and moved to Detroit Temple along with the Fate Museum project as we were building another museum there. While I was in Detroit, Jai Tirtha was the GBC there, but, and he wound up falling down and left ISKCON. I'm not even going to get started on that whole ordeal here, but in the chronological time, timeline section, I will mention more about it there. In the summer of 1984, my work in Detroit was over and I came back to the Los Angeles Temple to update the control system for the LA Museum there, for the new one that I had designed for the Detroit. Rameshwar, for the second time, offered me that I could head up the FATE project. He had originally asked me to take over in 1980 when Bardraj was removed, but at that time I had declined it because I didn't think I could handle designing a new control, electronic control system, programming it, and, pro and producing the multimedia presentations and, with the soundtrack and all, and managing the whole rest of the project at the same time. But in 1984, Adi Dave stepped down from the project, and so Rameshwar again asked me to take the project over. I was considering it, as I knew how much Srila Prabhupada wanted the project, and I wanted very much to do that service with him. I just had some reservations about working under Rameshwar again, but at the same time, after moving back to LA, I joined a small group of devotees who met and discussed Varnashram, Dharma. And within that group was an old friend of mine, Rabindranath, who is now the LA head pajari. But at the time, in 1984, he was working with the BBT archives. Uh, one day, Rabindranath showed me and other devotees in our Van Ashram meeting, a stack of about maybe two or three hundred copies of Srila Prabhupada's letters, which were sent to various GBC containing instructions by Srila Prabhupada regarding how the GBC was to manage ISKCON. This is the first time I had seen so many letters by Srila Prabhupada. Of course, Rabindranath would have had so many because at the time he worked at the BBT archives and had been in charge of filing the letters as devotees had been sending them into the BBT over the years in order to archive them for historical purposes. I want to relate what happened also just to give a little background to newer devotees so they can get a feel of what it was like for many of us Prabhupada disciples at that time and what nonsense we had to endure. In the 1970s, there was no digitized record of all of Srila Prabhupada's books, lectures, conversations, letters, etc. And in fact, copiers were not even a common thing in the 1970s. To get a copy, you had to go out to one of the copy shops and they had more, the more expensive copying machines. So to get a copy of one of Srila Prabhupada's letters was not even easy, so it wasn't a common thing when Srila Prabhupada was with us. I recall one day, in late 1973, I was in Karandar's office, and he was the GBC for LA then. He was one of the more advanced GBC members. And sitting on his desk with a stack of copies of Prabhupada's letters, probably not as big as the one Rabindranath had, but uh, he was a leading GBC. And so he arranged to have a number of Prabhupada's letters copied for his own reference. In the 1970s, it was sort of prestigious amongst Prabhupada's disciples how many copies of Prabhupada's letters one had. I only had about 10 letters in my personal collection at the time, most related to the fate project I was working on. But other than that stack that Karunder had, I had never seen, uh, I'm, I, well, I was going to say hardly anybody had any, any more than about 20 copies of Prabhupada's letters, but I had never seen a collection of Prabhupada's that many letters until 1984 when Rabindranath showed us you know, his, his personal stack. So I immediately asked him if I could borrow them so that I could go make my own copies. He gladly agreed. My service with the Fate Museum Project in 1984 was being funded by the BBT. 
Uh, and also another one of my really good friends back then was Rajendranath, who was in charge of the BBT at the time. Yeah, his name is Rajendranath, the director of the BBT, not to be confused with Rabindranath, who uh, loaned me the letters, who also served at the BBT. Anyway, the BBT had a professional copier. So I took the stack of Prabhupada's letters there to make copies. I had the stack on the copier and, and the machine had only started to just copy the first one or two of the letters when my good friend Rajendranath came in. He's the director of the BBT and he asked what I was copying. My mood right then was like a small kid in a candy shop. <laughs> I was so excited to have finally gotten my hands on so many of Prabhupada's letters. All excited, I told him, these are Prabhupada's letters and I'm making copies for myself. I mean, just seven short years earlier when Srila Prabhupada was present, every ISKCON devotee would have been thrilled to the max to have access to so many of Prabhupada's letters. And so I was expecting that Rajendranath would share in my excitement. I didn't even stop to think that as director of the BBT, he would have technically had access to all of Prabhupada's letters in the BBT archives anyway. But instead of sharing in my excitement, Rajendranath got extremely serious, grabbed the stack of letters away, and asked in an alarmed tone, where did you get these? I was taken aback by his reaction, but I told him that well, the Rabindranath's copies, he, he let me borrow them so I could make my own. Rajend, uh, you know, Rajendranath said, Rabindranath was told not to give copies of Prabhupada's letters to anyone. Rameshwar and I will deal with him later. He then told me, Srila Prabhupada's letters are off limits. Devotees are forbidden to read them. What? That was news to me. I had never even heard of that. And it was totally unacceptable. So I asked him what he was talking about. He told me that Rameshwar and Tamal Krishna decided that these letters, the Prabhupada's letters, should not, devotees should not have access to him. And they met with the GBC to ban all of Srila Prabhupada's letters. No one was to have, to, was to have access to him. I asked why. First, he gave me some preliminary reason about the letters were private correspondence and that many of the instructions Prabhupada gave were just for that one individual and not for the devotees in general. I didn't even agree with that. But I assured him, no, not these letters. These letters, the ones where Bendernath gave me, these were not private instructions. These were Srila Prabhupada's letters written to the GBC members where Srila Prabhupada was instructing them on how ISKCON was to be managed. Rajendranath got even more upset and told me, no, those less letters especially are banned the most. Those are the ones that no devotee should have access to. That made no sense. I demanded to know why. I told him, these are, these are instructions that all of Srila Prabhupada's disciples should have access to. All Prabhupada's disciples have a right to know how our spiritual master wanted his mission managed. As his disciple, it's my right to have access to the instructions and teachings of my spiritual master, but especially these. The GBC can't ban Srila Prabhupada's instructions, especially his instructions on how he wanted his mission to be managed. Rajendranath replied, all right, Amiyatma, I'm going to share something with you. The Rameshwar told me not to tell anyone, but since you're my friend, I'm going to share it with you. He said, he told me there are two reasons. One, he said that Srila Prabhupada had given instructions in some of those letters to the GBC and the GBC have not been able to follow them yet by 1984 due to various reasons. Someday they will, but right now, he said, they haven't been able to. So the problem will be if devotees read those letters and see that the GBC aren't doing what Prabhupada asked them or instructed them to do, they might rebel against the GBC and make it impossible for them to manage ISKCON. And second, he said, that there were instructions that Srila Prabhupada gave in person, verbally, to the GBC in GBC meetings 
And then he wrote a letter, but in the letter he didn't give the full instruction. He only gave part. The, the GBC knows the whole instruction because they received it verbally, but if the devotees read the letters that contain only part of the instructions, they will come to the wrong conclusions and think the GBC are not doing what he wanted. Again, devotees would rebel and turn against the GBC, and this could destroy ISKCON. Therefore, he told me that Rameshwar um, and Tamal met and decided that all of Prabhupada's letters had to be banned. Uh, and then he told me that the two of them met with the full GBC and this was agreed on. And so the BBT has to keep Prabhupada's letters away from the general devotees, especially the ones where Prabhupada gave instructions to the GBC on how they should manage. Rajendra Nath told me that he didn't like the idea himself, but they had convinced him that this was for the better good of ISKCON. And so he asked me to accept it as well. At the time in 1984, uh, I didn't realize just how similar this was to this incident of preventing devotees from going to be with Srila Prabhupada in his last days. But years later, I was, as I was rewriting the script, I could see it was actually the same thing. It was a pattern that these men repeated over and over. When Srila Prabhupada requested all the devotees to come to be by his side, these exact same GBC men, Rameshwar and Tamal, decided that if the devotees heard Prabhupada's request, it would lead to the total destruction of ISKCON. Therefore, they took all needed action to keep that request from being known. And now, some years later, these same GBC men came to the same conclusion using that same faulty logic and mindset and concluded that if the general devotees got access to Srila Prabhupada's letters, to his instructions on how he wanted his mission to be managed, these men were convinced that those instructions by Srila Prabhupada would wind up destroying ISKCON, thus to save ISKCON again. From Prabhupada's own words and instructions, these same men decided to take action to totally ban all of his letters. These men were just listening to their warped minds, and they had become convinced, and in turn convinced the rest of the GBC, that if the rank and file members of ISKCON were to read what Srila Prabhupada actually instructed us, his instructions, it would wind up destroying ISKCON. This again was complete insanity, and it was a total offense. Obviously, it was totally wrong. Well, I totally disagreed with what Rajendra Nath told me. I had no choice then, then but to let him take the letters away from me. Of course, it made me very curious, curious to know what letters he was referring to and to know what instructions Srila Prabhupada gave in those letters that the GBC didn't want us to see. Also, it eerily reminded me that this was exactly what Rameshwar had told Bardraj six years earlier in 1978. In 1978, Bardraj had asked Rameshwar if he could see that list, where they, that's what they were calling the July 9th letter at the time. He asked to see that list where Prabhupada wrote the names of the 11 men that allegedly were supposed to become actual gurus. Because Bardraj wanted, he wanted to see the list for himself to verify that it was actually from Prabhupada, that this is what Prabhupada and who Prabhupada had selected. Again, uh, I mean, Rameshwar at that time told him that there were, that that letter only was part of Prabhupada, only contained part of Prabhupada's instructions and that Prabhupada had given verbal instruction to the GBC, the full instruction. And so if devotees just read just the list that he wrote, which was the July 9th letter that he, Rameshwar told Bardraj that that would be, devotees would be misled. And therefore that list, he, Rameshwar told Bardraj was just for the GBC to see. So this idea that the, you know, the idea that the GBC agreed to ban Srila Prabhupada's instructions as how do he wanted the GBC to manage his society is just another example of how these GBC men thought at the time how poisoned 
their minds had become, that they actually decided it was best for ISKCON that devotees don't have access to Srila Prabhupada's written instructions, at least in, in the letters. And if they did, it could destroy ISKCON. Such logic and such thinking is treacherous. It's bogus, spelt with a big capital B. The July 9th letter, 1977, was, wasn't the only document that the GBC didn't want the devotees to see. There is also the letter written on July of 1974, which I refer to as the utmost urgent letter. And there was the direction of management document written in the July of 1970 and others. The dome, the direction of management, uh, is a whole other issue. And I will cover that in a separate section. Uh, I have an ans ancillary note on keeping Prabhupada's instructions on the Ritvik Guru issue secret, which regards a recurring theme of the GBC, either not wanting or open, uh, not wanting to uh, openly share or outright banning information about what Srila Prabhupada had instructed regarding the Ritvik Guru issue. I'm not sure when the GBC first banned Srila Prabhupada's letters, but I do know that it was in full force in 1984. Sounds Orwellian to me. In fact, it really sounds like 1984, which is quite poignant as this incident took place in 1984. For those who don't understand the analogy, George Orwell was a somewhat political fictional author whose books often had a surrealistic nature. Thus the phrase Orwellian is used in such context. In 1949, Orwell wrote a book titled 1984, which described a world which was governed by an impersonal totalitarian suppressive government. And here, in the actual year, 1984, I find that the GBC had banned Srila Prabhupada's teachings in the form of his letters. Yes, it was Orwellian, and it was 1984 for real. It also reminded me of Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451. In that book, it told about a totalitarian government that banned all books. The state police took all books and burned them. Books were said to burn at 451 degrees Fahrenheit, thus the title of the book. And that describes a state government that forbids critical individual thought and inqu inquisitive thought. These books, uh, uh, those books anyway, were required reading when I was in high school, and so both of them came to mind at that time. And they serve actually as appropriate examples of how totalitarian and suppressive the GBC were during those zonal Acharya days. So much so that they not only banned the, just the July 9th letter, which they did actually, um, that's a whole other topic, way back in July of 1977, but they wound up banning all of Srila Prabhupada's teachings and instructions that were given in his letters. Obviously, this policy of the GBC changed after the zonal Acharya system was dismantled, and then the BBT published a five-book set of Srila Prabhupada's letters and eventually came out with the Veda base that hopefully contains everything that the BBT archives have. 